while you're just learning to get yourself familiar with color schemes the best idea is to choose a color that's in the scheme in the scene that you're working for choose any it can be any color in the scene that you're working from and then base your scheme on that color or uh, letting that color be uh, more or less uh, the you would call the dominant color more or less in your painting itself but then everything else gets adjusted around that Color schemes are colors we select because of their relationship to the color wheel. We see that relationship because our eyes have in them rods and cones. The rods perceive only the values of those colors, but the cones are the receptors of the hues themselves. The hue is the color's identity. We use labels like yellow, yellow-orange, orange, yellow-green, etc in order to communicate the colors that our cones are perceiving. So the cones are perceiving these, the colors themselves, the hues themselves. The rods are perceiving the degree of lightness or darkness of each of those hues. But the cones are also perceiving the amount of hue that we see in each color that amount of hue is determined by how much of a color's opposite a color contains. So if a color contains none of its opposite or its complement as we know it to be, if that con color contains none of that, then we perceive it as being the highest saturation. That's the amount of hue that our cones are receiving. If that color has in it a little bit of its complement, the amount of hue we're perceiving in that color is less. And the degree of complement, or the amount of complement that is in the hue, contained in any hue we're looking at, will determine just how much of that hue we perceive. So if we perceive very little hue, we call that neutralized. The hue is neutralized or desaturated. When any two hues opposite each other on the color wheel are of equal hue amounts, we see neutral. We see no hue at all. As long as we can read any hue in any color, then that hue can become a part of the overall color scheme. Our color schemes are our strategies. These are the colors that we choose according to the relationship on the color wheel. We make those choices so that we can have color harmony. And also so that we can give expression to our subjects, an expression beyond perhaps what we're seeing. Although nature has perfect color schemes, so if we're adhering closely to nature, we can't fail. But if we want to give it an extra little punch, here are our options. We have five major kinds of relationships on the color wheel. Those are what we call our color schemes. The first is the monochromatic scheme. Monochromatic means a single color in its hue variations, in its value variations, and in its saturation variations. One of many examples I could show you is this painting by Claude Monet. You can see here that he's got variations of blue. Most of the painting, though, oh, 98% of the painting is made up of blue. You'll find that in monochromatic color schemes, uh, many times you will see the majority of the colors that appear are a single color. You might find little accents of some other colors sneaked in, but majority of the painting is done in one single color and variations of that color. 
variations is the key. So what I want you to notice here is how many variations of blue Monet has used here. Now I'll just take my little reader. This band shows the volume. This band shows the hue. And moving in this direction, we see the saturation or the intensity of that hue. So when this little mark moves down in this direction, let's get that a little bit lighter to make it easier for you to see. You see, as this moves down, it gets more and more neutral. That's totally neutral. We don't see any hue there at all. But then as I move it up, you begin to see more and more of that blue hue appear. And then as I move it all the way up to this band, you can see it's totally saturated in blue. So we have this full range, and, and Monet has used, uh, I don't think, I don't see where he might have used any fully saturated hue. In fact, it's rare that you're going to see in any master paintings uh, a whole lot of fully saturated hue. The master painters usually work within these various ranges of um, saturation, the variation of the saturation um, is what gives those, one thing that helps give the painting, the paintings their depth and, and their interest and they hold our attention. But as I move this around, I want you to notice, notice here the variation that we've got in value. Now here it goes almost neutral, almost neutral, almost totally neutral, but still a little bit of hue visible. Here we get a little bit lighter, but we're still uh, very close to that low saturation, uh, very close to the neutral. Here we go a little higher in saturation, you can see right here. And here we go lighter and higher in saturation. Here we've taken, he's gone almost totally neutral with these whites on the sands. He's, and that, what he's done there is he, to that blue, he has added the orange. And that brings up an important distinction we need to make. And that is the difference between the palette scheme and the painting scheme. And we've talked about the painting scheme so far. The painting scheme is the goal. Uh, that's the kind of painting we want it to be, or how we want the colors to be. In this case, a Monet's painting is monochromatic. But how we get there is the strategy. And that is the palette scheme. In other words, what colors do we need to put on that palette to make a painting like this work? So Monet's monochromatic scheme is in blues, and we can see here where he has leaned some of those blues towards what we might call ultramarine blue. We see right in here blues that lean a little bit more towards green, a bluer green like maybe phthalo blue or a cerulean blue. So perhaps on his palette, on the palette scheme itself, he might have these two blues. Now in order to get the variations in saturation, he needs that complement of blue. So perhaps on his palette, he also needed maybe red orange or orange. Either one of those would have done it. He would need to have the ability to go dark, the darkest dark, uh, the darkest dark we see right here, in these, this selection of colors. Now we know that if he chose ultramarine blue, that would give him pretty much that ability. And then the next thing he would need on his palette to help vary that value would be white. So we might say that his palette strategy then over here would be blue, blue-green, either orange or red-orange, and white. So uh, this is a good example of how monochromatic, a monochromatic scheme can be used very effectively without being boring at all. Another scheme that we have, a possible one to work with, is the analogous scheme. And that is the scheme uh, that involves only colors that are closely related, only hues that are closely related on the color wheel. But these can also be in all their variations of values and all their variations of saturations. This painting by Richard Schmidt is a good example of, of a painting done with the analogous scheme. So let's look at the painting scheme first of all. And we see that he's used a range of yellow greens. We see really, really st yellow, strong yellow greens leaning almost towards yellow right in here. So he's used this range right in here of yellow greens, 
uh, all the way over to blue-greens right in here. Now we don't see anywhere in the scheme itself where it goes actually into blue, so we could say that this is his range right here. One thing I want to also point out in here is that the painting itself appears to be very bright, almost uh, as if it were done in high saturations. But I want to show you something else. And what I want you to look for is right in here. This is the part, remember, this is the little dot that reads the uh, saturation of the hues themselves. So where it appears to be very highly saturated, right in here you see it's actually uh, almost a 60% saturation. As I move this all around, I want you to watch this. Watch this, where how it jumps as I move this throughout the painting. Now why is it that this has such a bright feeling to it in terms of saturation, uh, but yet all the hues that are used, all the colors that are used in here are a middle to low saturated uh, colors. Let's look at what else he's done. See all these neutrals? These neutrals actually enhance that feeling of saturation. And that's one way we can use those lowly low saturated hues is to help uh, in actually enhance the feeling of saturation. That's called one kind of simultaneous contrast where by the way we surround or use colors uh, surrounding colors that we want to appear bright by more neutral colors we're able then to achieve that uh, feeling of high saturation. So what palette, what palette of colors would be necessary in order for him to achieve this. He can actually achieve this range of colors by having on his palette yellow, a bluish green, the complement of yellow, and the complement of bluish green. In tube colors we might know those to be something like maybe cadmium yellow light or hansa yellow. Uh, for the bluish green we know that the Rembrandt Viridian would give us that and we also know that uh, thalo green would give us that. Uh, in the violet uh, we could use the deoxazine violet and for the red orange we could easily use the Rembrandt transparent oxide red. Those are just some options. We, we know that we have a number of palette options that we could use for a limited palette like that. So we can see already how the painting scheme and the palette scheme can be totally different. It's how we mix those colors on the palette that gives us the results that we want. Another possible scheme is one we call the dyads. We use, with the dyads, we use only two colors. Now, those colors can have several possible relationships. That relationship could be analogous colors, two colors that are analogous, the only colors that we see in the painting itself, or the predominant colors we see in the painting. They could have any kind of relationship on the color wheel. What we most commonly see are uh, a dyad of complementary colors, what we call a complementary scheme. And that simply means that the only two colors that appear in the painting are colors which are complements of each other, are hues which are complement, complements of each other on the wheel. A good example of that is this painting by Winslow Homer, where we can see uh, the only two colors in this painting are blue and orange. You can see all the variations of blues as you move through here, and you can see all the variations of orange. When we bring our color reader over, uh, we can see these are really, really deep oranges. You see right over in here, very, very deep, dark oranges. They, some of them fall a little bit towards red, orange, and some fall a little bit more in orange, but that is the orange range. Then we go into the blue range and we see very low intensity blues, very low saturation blues. 
lots of variations in values, a lot of variations in the alternations of blues and oranges. And we see even in the sky, very, very low saturation of blues and oranges. So that's a good example of a dyad of complementary colors. Now for the palette of the complementary colors, Homer would have only needed uh, very dark versions of blues and oranges. In his day, probably those earth colors of, of burnt sienna and burnt umber might have been the oranges and red oranges that he would have used in there. Uh, probably ultramarine blue or uh, maybe uh, perhaps even the thalo blues, but he would have used dark versions of these colors, these hues, along with white. And that brings us now to the triads and the tetrads. A triad is a selection of any three colors on the color wheel. An equidistant triad, such as we see here, is a selection of colors which have on the wheel three colors between them. The kinds of equidistant triads available to us are the primary triad, such as we see here, the secondary triad made up only of secondary colors, and the tertiary triad, such as this one. The neat thing about the tertiary triad is that we have uh, two kinds of choices. We have the yellow-orange, the blue-green, and the red-violet choices, and we have the red-orange, yellow-green, and blue-violet choices. Then we have another kind of choice, which is called the split complementary. And that is when a triad of a complement and its split. In other words, we have a set of complements here. Every color on the wheel has a complement, so every color or hue on the wheel has this potential. And that is, we select a complement, a set of complements, we use one color of the complement itself, and the other two colors are made up of split versions of the complement to that color. So for the split complement option of the triad, we have all these options where we can se select any hue and then select its split version on the opposite side. And yet another option for the triad scheme is what we call the split analogous. What you see right here, where any hue is chosen, and then we select two of its analogous colors where we skip a color on either side, or skip a hue on either side. In this case, a split analogous scheme would be yellow-orange, red-orange, and yellow-green. But we can take that concept of the split analogous scheme all the way around the color wheel. Any set of three colors where you choose one hue and then you choose two other hues that have a single analogous hue between them. So you see we have lots of options for the triad. There's one more option and that is the gamut, the gamut, the way the gamut is different is um, it, it needs to be created from the intensity wheel, a wheel that shows all the uh, variations of intensity of every single hue. And so what the gamut does then, it selects colors from each hue, colors from the various intensity choices. It can be of any shape, we'll just use this shape as our example. But the difference between the gamut and the regular color scheme is that when we're setting up a traditional color scheme, such as I've shown you of triads or tetrads or any traditional color scheme, we give ourselves the option of the full range of, of intensities or saturations. With the gamut, we limit that. With the gamut, we select a particular saturation of each of the three hues we select if we're working the triad gamut, such as we're working, we would be working here. 
So we, we limit ourselves. We take this, this chosen intensity of each one. So in, in the case of this kind of gamut, it would be this intensity of red or this saturation of red, this saturation of yellow, and this saturation of blue-violet. And those would be the only hues, only colors on the wheel. All their variations of value would be available to us. But the, right in here then would be that range of colors that uh, we would be able to get from these three. So that's the difference in the gamut. So you see we have lots and lots and lots of options just with the triad itself. In our history of art, we can go all the way back into Egyptian times and find examples of where the triad color scheme has been used as the painting scheme. So here's just one example of thousands. This is by Claude Monet, and it's easy to see here his triad scheme. As the actual painting scheme, he's used the yellow-green, uh, the greenish blue, or you might call it blue-green, and the orange. We can see the orange variations in here. On his palette, most likely, he's had that full value range of just yellow-green, uh, blue-green, or greenish-blue, and the oranges. Our fifth scheme, then, is the tetrad scheme. For the tetrad scheme, we will have four colors. So if you have a rectangle like we have here uh, on the points of the rectangle, just like on the points of the triangle we looked at, we have the colors that would go into the scheme. The three major kinds of tetrad schemes available to us are the double split scheme. It works on the same principle as a split complementary, double split complementary scheme. We just call it double split usually. So you can see the two complements and they're split. So rather than put these two complements on the palette, if you're for the palette scheme, we put the splits. We put the green and the blue rather than the blue-green, and we put the red and the orange rather than the red. And with those four colors, then we create the colors that we want for our painting. This can be true for any set of complements. So we have lots of choices there. Another kind of can use is what we call the equidistant double complement. That scheme is made up of two sets of complements equal distance apart on the color wheel. You can see here the points, where the points are touching. We have the set of complements of, of yellow, orange, and blue, violet. And we have the set of complements of green, uh, green and red. We see between each one of those points to intervals of hue. So one, skip two, one, skip two, one, skip two, one, skip two, and you've got a set of equidistant double complements. That scheme too can be made up of any place on the color wheel where you can find that relationship. Another kind of tetrad is what we would call the double analogous, where two analogous colors and their complements are selected for the colors that we use, either the colors that we use on our palette or the colors that we choose to show in our paintings. And that too, that too can be composed of any set of analogous colors adjacent to each other and their complements. We can also select a, a tetrad of analogous colors. We simply call that an analogous tetrad, where we select four analogous colors that we use in our painting, that we show in our painting. So in this case, the analogous colors we would choose would go from blue-green over to violet. So it would include violet, blue-violet, blue, and blue-green. And the variations of values and the variations of saturations would be the only, one, only, uh, the only colors that would show in our painting. For that, on the palette, we would need a complement. 
Now, usually on the palette, we would choose one complement. Uh, uh, maybe the complement of blue or the complement of blue violet would serve as the complement for all of these. We could choose two complements. Uh, we could choose the complement of violet, which would be yellow, and the complement of blue green, which would be red orange, to put on the palette but they would only be used on the palette uh, to decrease the saturation of any of these four colors. Now those are the major uh, potential. You can see what a variation you have there of choices were often used by the luminous group and whenever we want to create luminosity in our paintings those are always good choices. But then in this painting by Albert Bierstadt we can see the yellow green, the red violet, orange, and the blue green. Those would be the colors that he would put on his palette. And you can see mixtures of these in here. You can see the mixtures of the oranges and the red violets. Let's take away that color wheel and show you that. You see right in here mixtures of orange and red violet. A bit, we can see a little bit of that red violet right back in here. We see varying degrees of the blue, the group bluish green. Uh, and, and the various intensities in these areas right back in here. And we see those yellow greens popping in right here and here. So it's not uncommon to find the tetrad used in the luminous paintings, but then when you look through history, you'll find various kinds of double split complements, double complements, analogous colors, and even the split analogous complement. Take a single scene like that with the same color but try several schemes of the same scene where you're using the same initial color for example if you were uh you could take the color red orange and you could build yourself a an equidistant triad based on red orange use that interpret the scene and then maybe use the same uh scene where you take the same initial color and try a split analogous you see what i'm saying that you can find different ways to in, to use color to interpret the same scheme by uh, same scene by varying the scheme that you actually choose scheme and scene that's difficult to say <laughs> be sure and view all of our quick tips and while you're doing so subscribe to the channel click on the bell so you'll always get a notice when we produce a new quick tip which is every week and if you have a question, leave it in the comments section and we'll make a quick tip for you. Also, take a trip over to DyingMinds.com where I have full length lessons, downloads, DVDs, lots of other stuff there, some free stuff for you. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter and that way you'll always be informed every time we do something new.